You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John is joined today by Dr. L.J. Krumenecker. Dr. L.J. Krumenecker is an Idaho-based paleontologist and educator. His main research interests are the Mesozoic vertebrate assemblages of Idaho, the early Triassic Paris biota, the Cambrian explosion as recorded in the Spence Shale, and dinosaur reproduction and social behavior as recorded by Eggs and Burrows. He was born and raised in Idaho and currently resides there, where he performs research at Idaho State University through the Department of Geosciences and the Idaho Museum of Natural History, while also currently teaching life sciences at Idaho State University. Are you noticing thinning hair? Is it time to take action? Choose the licensed medical provider that's right for you, at half the cost of your local pharmacy. Keeps is convenient. You get professional care for hair loss from the comfort of your home without ever visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy. Treatment is delivered right to your door on your schedule with the flexibility of 3, 6 and 12 month delivery options. Plus you can adjust, pause or cancel your plan at any time. Thicker, fuller hair is a rinse away with natural, science-backed ingredients that are expertly formulated to make thinning hair look thicker. Keeps Thickening Shampoo uses science-backed ingredients for a healthy hair growth with all natural formulas that are safe for everyday use. Producer Ross uses Keeps because of their clinically proven and FDA-approved hair loss treatment options. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video and for the free product. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer, to get started, go to keeps.com slash event horizon show or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash event horizon show. Dr. L.J. Krumenacher, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Now, Doctor, one of the most disturbing events in the history of life on Earth is the great dying, as I recall, the end Permian that led to the age of the dinosaurs. But that extinction event was so horrific that up to 70% of all species on Earth went extinct that were extant at the time. What did the Earth look like just before that extinction event? What were the animals like? Just before that extinction event, life was flourishing as well as it had ever done. You had the ancestors of ourselves, of mammals. You had synapsid organisms. You had the ancestors of dinosaurs like the diapsids. You had marine invertebrates, very similar to you have today. You had flourishing ecosystems doing really, really well. Unfortunately, they just kind of bit the dust of this extinction. Like you say, at least 70-ish percent of them. So what was the dominant group of species at the time of that extinction? Would it have been the amphibians? So you would have had a lot of amphibians. Amphibians are very common in the end of the Permian. You also had a lot of synapsid reptiles, which are, or I shouldn't say reptiles, mammal-like reptiles is an informal term for them. They're called synapsids based on the skull anatomy, but they're mammalian ancestors. And you also had diapsid reptiles, again, ancestors to birds and crocodiles and dinosaurs. You had a, a healthy mix with all of these contributing a, a good chunk to the biosphere, as well as your typical arthropods and mollusks and different marine organisms. So Now, would the, uh, I guess the ammonites and those types of marine organisms would have still been around, right? Yeah, you had precursors to the ammonite, uh, ammonites to be specific called ammonoids. But yeah, they were very common in the late Paleozoic. Now, what about life like I mean, do we have any way of, of studying like soft tissue life, like jellies and things like that in the fossil record for that time period, that switch over time period? So I don't think we have off the top of my head know of any latest Permian right before the extinction, Lagerstadt. Lagerstadt are fossil sites where you get unusual preservation and or quantity. But in the late Paleozoic, we do have places where you get soft bodied preservation like the uh, Mason Creek biota of the uh, coal measures of Illinois that are probably, if I can do my math right here, about 50 million years older than the Permian extinction where you get lots of soft bodied organisms. So scattered throughout the later Paleozoic, you do get examples of uh, soft tissues like that preserved on occasion. So I'm not aware of one right up at the end of the Permian, which would be awesome. 
So in other words, there are within, even within the fossil record, some things just don't preserve. And there are entire many, many, many species from any period that we will never know even existed, right? Yeah, and that makes me really sad because uh, I love to uh, think about the diversity of life and just knowing that there's things you're missing just as a scientist, that's frustrating. But yeah, there's there's a whole branch of paleontology called taphonomy where you're looking at the biases that go into what does and doesn't preserve and why. Now, where do the dinosaurs begin, the proto, you know, the, the precursor, the dinosaur in the Permian period? What What does that look like? So you would have had... Um, again, these little diapsid reptiles, they wouldn't have looked too much like dinosaurs or anything super special. But to be honest, I don't know a lot about the end Permian diapsids, but I'm, I'm surmising they would have been, at least to the general person, just fairly small and lizard-like. It wasn't until just after that extinction where you started to get your proto-dinosaurs diversifying and then towards the end of the Triassic, just after the Permian extinction, where there was actually another extinction event that really made room for the dinosaurs to evolve and diversify. Now, that would have been the uh, Jurassic, right? Yeah, it would have been the, it's called the Triassic extinction, right at the boundary between the Triassic and Jurassic. And there was another major extinction event then, not as bad as the Permian, but uh, this, it knocked out a lot of organisms that allowed room for dinosaurs to diversify and take over for the rest of the uh, Mesozoic era. Now, was that another volcanically linked, like the end Permian, is that linked to volcanism? As far as I know, there is not a good understanding of what caused the uh, Triassic extinction. You know, <laughs> that scares me because when you have something that can cause a, an extinction event, you can't figure out what it is. That's, that just seems dangerous to me. <laughs> just live each moment like it's your last, so just in case. It is, yep, yeah, and, and hope it's an asteroid because at least, at least it would put on a good show. Oh, that'd be awesome. Minus death. Yeah, did you guys uh, happen to see any aurora borealis up in Idaho during that outburst uh, a few weeks ago? We did. That was the first time I've ever seen it. And I'm so glad. I, I felt bad I had my son with me. And we went out to the foothills east of uh, town, uh, Blackfoot, Idaho, here, and couldn't see anything. So I took him home over to his mom's house for the night and went back out. And about one in the morning, all of a sudden, it all showed up. And I was out to a different spot. But it was the uh, most glorious thing I've ever seen. Never got to see it. But it was absolutely spectacular yeah i saw it too i, I was waiting for dusk <laughs> and I, it was just like oh will i see anything and as soon as it darkened sufficiently to see it because you know it's rather dim but as soon as it did that it was bursting everywhere it looked like iceland and i'm in the midwest <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> it was it was just spectacular i don't know that we're ever gonna have that opportunity this south again although i shouldn't say that because the solar cycle is Still got another year to go. <laughs> so anyway, back to the dinosaurs and the beginnings of them. Now, where does, now you work with the geology of Idaho. Where does the dinosaur age begin there? Where do you start seeing the earliest fossils that, that you study? See, the earliest dinosaur fossils we know of from Idaho, we actually have some from the early Jurassic, just when, after dinosaurs started to diversify. These are down from the Bear Lake area in southeast Idaho, if anyone knows of that area. But it's um, some footprints from some theropod meat-eating dinosaurs. They're pretty uncommon. There's not a lot of good exposures there, but those are some of the uh, oldest dinosaur fossils in Idaho. The ones that I work on are from the middle of the Cretaceous, right around 100 million years ago, and they occurred just on the Idaho side of the Wyoming border. Now, how far does that go? Does that actually go to the end? Cretaceous, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Do you have like a KT boundary anywhere in the state? No, I, I wish we did. These rocks are around 100 million years old. We've got about a 5 million year sliver that preserves dinosaurs in these rocks before the sea level came up and inundated the state. And then after that, whatever used to be there has been eroded away and we don't have a record. So what do, um, generally speaking, what do uh, Idaho's dinosaurs tell you about the general climate, locally speaking, of Idaho during that period? In other words, do you see things a lot different from what you might find from the same period in China or some other location? It, it's fairly similar to what we see, for instance, in North America in uh, Utah, which has a, a better exposed rock record and rocks of very similar age. And globally, we see that this was a really hot time, a hot house time with uh, higher average temperatures, much higher sea levels, little if any uh, polar ice. 
Yeah, nothing. And then also higher oxygen at the time as well, right? There's some evidence for that. Yes, yeah. yes, higher oxygen. It's inter that's interesting too, because I mean, can you imagine fires <laughs> back then? It's terrifying. Yeah, you start adding more oxygen. That's that's bad news. So what are the specific types of dinosaurs that you're studying? In other words, what for everybody that's interested in, in dinosaur species, what are some of the things that you see? Because I imagine it's probably different than the, the stereotypical tyrannosaur and things like that. Or, or do you have those? Oh, we do. So I'll, I'll tell you, we'll walk you through it here. But Idaho's kind of weird as far as its dinosaurs. When you're looking for dinosaurs, generally the stereotypical image is you're going to find, you know, great big bones of great big animals. And for a long time, people came out and looked in these little areas where we have dinosaur bearing rocks and they could not find any large bones like you'd stereotypically expect. It wasn't until people started getting on their hands and knees and looking for bones, you know, oh, say a vertebra about the size of a quarter or a, a femur or thigh bone that's only about five or six inches long broken into pieces. It's when people put their noses to the ground, they started finding this stuff. And usually when you're out in other places like Utah, one of the golden places for dinosaurs, it's not terribly hard to find giant bones. But in Idaho, it's weird. You find the little bones, which should be really, really rare. And that ties into what is the most common Idaho dinosaur. The full scientific name is Arictodromius cubicularis, means digging runner of the lair. It is a small plant-eating dinosaur, two-legged, similar to a group that's very informally called Hypsilophodontids. But uh, what's special about Arictodromius is we found its remains in fossil burrows with juveniles showing that it had a social life living underground. I kind of compare it to like a, a dinosaur groundhog. So that's interesting, a fossil burrow. So I w I'm imagining mud, you know, an avalanche or flood or something burying this. Is that how that happens? Yeah, it looks like these burrows were either filled in during flooding events and possibly just when there'd be burrow collapse because the sediment above was uh, unstable. It's not uncommon for these skeletons to look like roadkill and just be flattened with their, their limbs sprawled out. Now, what about articulated stuff? In other words, do you have formations in Idaho? where you're actually finding, you know, a, a close to semi-assembled skeleton right there on a, on a sheet of rock, or is it just loose bones? A lot of it's loose bones for uh, a ricto, as I call it again. Sometimes you'll get nice articulated skeletons. Sometimes they're more of a jumble, and that might be more of a, whether or not a flooding event filled the burrow or the burrow just collapsed. Right now at uh, Montana State University, there's a student working on what could be the best erecto specimen I know of from Idaho that it's, I'm impatient to see it when it's all done. It's gonna take hundreds of hours to get out of the rock, but it's got its legs curled up under its butt with its tail going one way and its back going another way in articulated arms. It might be a nearly perfectly articulated individual, which would be awesome. But sometimes you'll just find a jumble of bones. And if it's, if it's for a dinosaur other than erecto, you're lucky if you find one bone or tooth at all. It's really, really hard to find any any other bones from other dinosaurs other than this little burrower. That's got to be frustrating as a paleontologist where you think you have a species, but all you have to go from is a single tooth. <laughs> so you have to... <laughs> Extremely frustrating. <laughs> yeah. That teeth of, you know, the apex predator, you know, everyone likes the big, sexy, meat-eating dinosaurs. And the teeth get about two inches long. But all we found are the teeth. I keep telling my students, you go out, find me a skull, you automatically pass my class unofficially. So, I mean, it kind of works that way if you look at nature now, you know, I mean, you're more likely to come across a bone, a single bone, perhaps of a chicken resulting from KFC in somebody's lunch, <laughs> or then you are an actual articulated skeleton and you need to catch that skeleton when it's a roadkill or else it's going to get dispersed as predators and everything come in there. Skeletons just don't hold together in nature. And yeah, that's got to be a, a thrill when you find something articulated like that because, you know, it had to go through even more <laughs> chances of, of not being there than just a single fossilized bone did, which still won the lottery as far as bones go. What percentage of animals would you estimate out of any species actually fossilized? In other words, how common is fossilization for a large organism on Earth? Oh, I'd, I'd have to say way less than 1% would be the best number I could give you. But yeah, it, it's extremely rare. 
you may be dead, but if you become a fossil, you did win the lottery, like you say in that aspect. So, yes, and I'm hoping I fossilize, make myself useful for a lot longer of <laughs> a period than than normal. Do you find evidence in we were talking about plant eating dinosaurs, but we could apply this to meat eating dinosaurs? Do you find evidence of the dinosaurs? food, meaning do you know what ate what? In other words, what plants or this carnivorous dinosaur, what other dinosaur was it eating and things like that? Do you find any kind of evidence for that in the fossil record? Oh, yeah, you definitely can. There are plenty of examples of bones that will have tooth marks from either crocodilians or other predatory dinosaurs. And if, if they're really well preserved, you can cautiously assign them to a taxa, an animal type that made those tooth marks. You can make educated guesses, I guess you'd say, by looking at the plants that are fossilized in the same rocks. You can look at the uh, microscopic tooth wear on the teeth of different dinosaurs to get an idea of which uh, plants they're eating and if they were, say, full of harder materials or softer materials. So you can, you can make fairly educated hypotheses that way. And I guess you can look at life today and kind of glean some idea with similarities, you know, convergent evolution of sorts, I guess, oh, yeah. where you see one type of tooth is good for this. <laughs> and you see the same similar sort of thing with a dinosaur, you can say that probably what that was doing, right? Yeah, you could do that. A good example is a T-Rex is overrated. I think a much cooler meeting dinosaur is Spinosaurus. If you look at a Spinosaur teeth, they're very aberrant compared to normal meeting dinosaur teeth. They're much more crocodile-like and conical, and that fits in with a number of other pieces of evidence suggesting that Spinosaurus had some degree of aquatic habit that it lived in, and being a specialized, give or take, at least a happy fish eater. But you can look at his teeth, and you can definitely see that from its teeth as an example. Yeah, and as I recall, isn't there an ammonite somewhere that, that's got tooth marks in it consistent with like a, a plesiosaur jaw or something like that? I think I've seen that famous one. Yeah, with with a mosasaur. Yeah, yeah there, mosasaur, there are numerous, mosasaur. Numerous, yeah, yeah. yeah. which yeah. incidentally, that's a, that's unusual because Spinosaurus teeth are common. I mean, that's a common fossil that you run across. In, Very uh, common in Morocco. <laughs> yeah, in Morocco, common. in Morocco, and so that was an aquatic environment. So, what would a Spinosaurus have looked like in opposition to a dinosaur? What what would set it as, aside from, say, a, a sauropod? Well, it's got its uh, its telltale big spine on the back. It also belongs to a group of theropods that had extra large claws on their uh, forelimbs, basically great big large thumb claws, somewhat. And really interesting, if you look at the skull of Spinosaurus, if you do a quick Google of that, you'll see that it looks a lot like a crocodile skull. Again, there's there's some convergent evolution going on, showing this had a degree of a uh, habit similar to crocodilians and feeding on fish. Convergent evolution is something that fascinates me because you do see it a lot and you see things like a shark is shaped similar to a dolphin for a reason, even though they are very, very widely separated species. And that's something that we think about in astrobiology a lot is the idea that maybe there are bioforms that are common to complex life in the universe at large. In other words, you might see something that looks vaguely like a shark or a fish in an aquatic environment on an exoplanet. What do you think, as a paleontologist, would be a good candidate for something like that, as far as convergent evolution goes, where it's just so useful and you see it so many times in nature that you very well may see this on an exoplanet that's similar to Earth, at least? Well, I think for uh, any exoplanet that has a good watery environment, again, it's those stereotypical body plans, again, like you said, like for a shark or a dolphin, or a fish, kind of that fusiform shape, something like that. I, I would be greatly surprised if that, that wasn't very common in a, other possible exoplanets with a watery environment. Or, or think of a, something with an atmosphere similar to the density of ours, where you'd have to have wing-like structures. So those wouldn't surprise me. I can't speak from, from knowledge of a lot of that, but I'd be surprised otherwise. Yeah, wing-like structures are interesting because there's only a few ways that's going to work. And... I mean, flight is flight through gas, and that's what you're going to see in, you know, a, an Earth-like exoplanet. I don't know what you would see on a super Earth, mm -hmm. <laughs> something twice, something twice the mass of Earth. Can you imagine what the bone structure or something <laughs> like that would look like? So interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you robust is not quite the word. <laughs> yeah. Now you've also worked at a another uh, 
very famous formation in Wyoming, the Green River Formation. And I guarantee you, uh, no small portion of this audience has a fish, a Nishia fish or something like that from this fossil formation because they preserve so well and so numerously. Now, what was your work in that formation like and what were you looking for? So in the Green River Formation, I've got a research project that I'm very slowly working on. It's actually um, in the same rocks in uh, Utah, if anyone knows Spanish Fort Canyon. But the uh, Green River Formation, I'll give a little background. It's around 50 million years old, give or take, formed by a series of very large lakes and lake-related environments. And in the Spanish Fort Canyon area of Utah, I'm working on a site that a friend of mine, a uh, mentor named Steve Robison, showed me that appears to be a bird rookery along the uh, margins of a lake. You've got bird eggshell that's scattered through this macritic limestone for at least, oh, I think it was about 800 feet before it was faulted. And I need to go up and look at the other side of the fault. But there's bird eggshell and bird bones and crocodile scoots and snails and fish bits. And my interest in there is describing what's called the taphonomy of the site, which is kind of like the uh, paleontology version of crime scene investigation, where you try and figure out the circumstances behind that fossil deposit. And just to be a nerd, just because a big rookery of ancient birds is kind of cool. Absolutely. So taphonomy, when you when you think about that, what do you think about that re- relatively recent find that seems to be from <laughs> the very end Cretaceous, like the day the dinosaurs went away. Are you aware of that discovery? And it's a Tannis can... site, I think. Yeah, it's I think it's a Tannis site. Uh, yeah. Any any views on that? I would love to know more about it. Unfortunately, last I heard, it's not really scientifically accessible for uh, people to go in and kind of critique the hypotheses that have been made so far. It seems like it's being tightly held. Like I'm totally open to it. It would be awesome. I have colleagues that have mentioned some concerns with the uh, stratigraphy of the rocks there and how they might not be in the exact position where they think they would be for the very end Cretaceous event. Definitely, it preserves some amazing fossils, and it's very suggestive. But uh, until they let more scientists in there, I can't give a good, good opinion, though I'd absolutely love to hear more about it. Now, stratigraphy, you know, the layering of the rock that, you, you know, everybody's familiar with that, you know, is obviously... We have sedimentary rock. That's that's where you find fossils. Can that get discombobulated? In other words, can it get confusing when you're trying to date something from a layer? Can, like, I don't know, earthquakes, geology, movement really mess that up and make it unclear as to what the date of the object you're looking at is? Oh, absolutely. A good example here is the rocks I work in here in eastern Idaho, They're part of what's called the Wyoming Thrust Belt, where we had a uh, succession of eastward migrating um, tectonic events, build little mountain ranges going from eastern Idaho into western Wyoming. And those have totally screwed up the original stratigraphy. So you have what should be on on the top is on the bottom and vice versa, with things thrust over each other and through each other. And to make it more complicated, if we go back to the uh, rocks, I look at the dinosaurs in here in Idaho. I don't think I mentioned the name of the rocks. It's called the Wayan Formation. And it's a series of uh, dominantly red and brightly colored rocks formed by rivers and floodplains. But the problem is you go right under the Wayan and you get a beach deposit. You get under that, you get more red beds like the Wayan. You go under those red beds, you get lake beds made out of limestone. You go under that limestone, you get more red beds. You go under those red beds, you get more limestone. You go under that limestone, you get more red beds. These things all look the same. And it's very, very complicated. It took about 100 years of geologic work for people to even uh, be able to piece together these repeating sequences out here. So if you don't have a good index fossil that tells you the age or a good radiometric date, it can get really hard to tell where you are in that big pile of rocks. Paleontology is hard, and actually geology is hard <laughs> in general. <laughs> but I think, I think a lot of people don't realize that, that we can piece together anything in, a, in the fossil record, that we can actually get a snapshot. Past life on Earth is astonishing because you would think, well, that wouldn't survive. Everything rots away. But in, a certain, in these certain conditions, you can get it. Do you think that fossils in general are common across the universe? And, you know, another astrobio question. 
do you think that there are, could we take you as a paleontologist to a, an exoplanet that we discover had life, that, you know, and would you expect to find fossils there? In other words, is this something that's rare to Earth or is it something that's probably ubiquitous for anything that's ever had life? I would think it's pretty ubiquitous where you've got at least an active tectonic cycle with erosion and deposition and reworking of the crust in an active biosphere. I would expect that um, that would be pretty common. I, I sometimes tell my students, I think it would be absolutely fascinating if you go in the future at some point where astropaleontology is a field and, oh, here's your uh, thesis project. You're going to go to this exoplanet and put together a summary of the history of life on it. You know, it's not daunting at all. Yeah, but that's really fires the imagination, doesn't it? <laughs> that, so awesome. Yes, I would love it. You know, it's, it's and it, it, it's interesting because, again, with convergent evolution, if you've started finding fossils, on, well, let's take Mars, because Mars appears like it might have been able to fossilize something at one point. Mm -hmm. Had there been something there, I don't know if you could find anything microbial, it would be hard. But it, if there was something more there, then Mars probably could have preserved it. So the, the question is, is that... Man, paleontology, If uh, in the future, the far future, when humans are all around the galaxy, paleontology is going to be huge. <laughs> oh, I, I, what I wouldn't give to know more about that future. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you just, it's all guesswork, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now, LJ, back to the end Permian and the beginning of the next age afterwards. Now, it appears that life recovered unusually rapidly, right? You, you have a recent paper on this that it, it happened much quicker than we thought it would have happened. Yeah, there's a, a spot I mentioned, uh, Bear Lake before, fossil site down there. It's called the Paris Biota, not after uh, Paris, France, but there's a little town named Paris there. And just west of Paris on the Idaho side of Bear Lake, there's a fossil deposit I found as a young college student that got a lot of paleontological attention took about 10 years. I found these weird little fossils where, again, I'm a dinosaur guy. These weren't particularly fancy looking or anything. They looked like little roadkill shiny worms in the rock. And after about 10 years of showing them to different paleontologists, someone funny said, oh, that's a fossil sponge. And not only is that a sponge, it's a sponge that should have been extinct about 200 million years earlier. And it turned out to be what's called a Lazarus taxon like the uh, biblical story of Christ raising Lazarus from the dead, where you have this sudden fossil that was supposed to be extinct a long time ago. Maybe the listeners would be familiar with, you know, the example of a coelacanth that was thought to have gone extinct that we actually still have. But because of that fossil sponge, um, I managed to get a large team that was interested and has come out and done excellent work. And they've kind of let me tag along for the ride as a helper, but it's led by a Dr. Brayard, from France, and forgive me, Arno, I forget which university you're at there in France, but Dr. Briar has assembled what's called the Paris Biota team, and they've put a lot of work into this fossil site, and it's about one million years after the Permian extinction, and it got a lot of attention and managed to get my name on a little nature paper because it shows that uh, marine ecosystems recovered about 10 times faster than was previously thought after that Permian extinction. It was thought it took about 10 million years but again, this site is about 1 million years after, and it's a very diverse, roughly modern-looking marine ecosystem showing that, uh, I guess, uh, as Malcolm said, life will find a way. Now, with Lazarus species, where you, you find something that you thought was extinct, and you mentioned the infamous coelacanth, which apparently they taste terrible. They're not good eating. I did not know But they are a <laughs> extreme. Yeah, supposedly it's terrible, and they, they smell. And the <laughs> So the fishermen knew about these before the paleontologists. They knew this fish was there for centuries. They just didn't know what it was. And, yeah, it, it apparently is not good eating. Um, though I suspect I have, I, I do suspect that a herring from the Green River Formation might have been okay. Yeah. yeah. But anyway... But back to it, the, the idea of the Lazarus species, do you think there is still room today in our world, you know, in the deep sea somewhere to find a Lazarus species that still exists? Do you think that's still possible? Could a coelacanth happen again? Oh, I, I would never say no. I don't like to say, I don't like to say anything's impossible. I just like to say, I don't know how, or I don't know, but I, I wouldn't totally rule it out. Who knows? I, I think it's a little little unlikely that we're going to be lucky enough to find something like a plesiosaur, which would make me very happy. 
but I do think there's still room for discoveries like that. You never know. There's always the Loch Ness Monster, which <laughs> some people say looks like one. But anyway, but I, I'm thinking more in terms of, so, you know, when somebody goes down, James Cameron goes down to the Challenger Deep or something like that, some really ridiculously inaccessible part of the ocean, which there are a lot of those, mm-hmm. you, you wonder, could a trilobite? <laughs> well, that would that would make my day, to put it mildly, yes. <laughs> So put it mildly, especially, you know, the trilobites absolutely amazed me because they were so dominant for so long and so diverse and their evolutionary, I mean, some of the stuff these things could biologically do, like grow multiple <laughs> eyes out of out of uh, silica is just astonishing, but they're gone, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, if, if I didn't do dinosaurs, I'd do trilobites. I'd do a little little side hustle science where I get to help a little bit in the Cambrian, but, but, uh, that, that's a whole separate fascinating area. It is. And it's just so different because it, if you think of earth in terms of it being someone else's exoplanet, right? Mm-hmm. This planet has looked very, very different at different periods, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, one with prototaxites, you know, giant mushrooms breaking up the soil and that's all that's there and they're catching fire versus the dinosaurs versus now where it's again very different Mm -hmm. and that's something i think about a lot is how does an exoplanet change as far as life because evolution doesn't stop Mm -hmm. it's going to happen and evolution is something that's universal because you don't see only way you end up with anything complicated oh yeah and so it's 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 just a sort of a fascinating thing. Now, you as a paleontologist, do you sit down and think about these things, these these possibilities of of Lazarus species existing today, and things like that? And and would that ever even be something worth looking for? Oh, it, it's always worth looking for. I wouldn't I wouldn't dare say it's not worthwhile. But this is, this is the sort of thing that I'll just say it, it. It's worth looking for. It's something I think about. Is there's Part of the reason I do science is just hopeless romanticism where where I like a good discovery or a good mystery or a good find. And uh, given up on that, I wouldn't be doing science, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the foundation of it. Now, in regards to the fossil record, and we were talking about how rare it is to, for a fossil to form anyway. You know, it's the, the organism won the lottery if they're going to preserve like that. But there's also entire missing pieces that are gone probably forever. And this is leading to the question of how much of our fossil record do we really still have that's accessible? Oh, and that that is is such a hard question to answer other than to say a lot. A lot is going to be missing. And definitely the farther back in time you go, the more chance there have been for rocks and fossils to be destroyed and recycled. So generally, we understand the fossil record better the closer it is to us because it's had less time to get reworked and destroyed. Yeah, but even that, I mean, look at the hominids, you know, even though, you know, fossils- Oh, they're so fragmentary. It's so fragmentary, and it's, I mean, it's, there's plenty of people looking into it. It's it's human history. Oh yeah. And evolution, but yet so little, so little is there. And you could imagine a time, given the the paucity of of human fossils, had we gone extinct relatively early, no one would have ever known we were here. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's the sort of thing that could keep me up at night just thinking about that is what don't we know that we don't know, for lack of a better way to put it. Which brings us to sort of the ultimate idea there is that the Solarian hypothesis, you know, Adam Frank and, and those guys, that if there had been a prior technological civilization existing on Earth in the distant past, millions of years ago, there may be no trace of it preserved, even if it was extensive. Is, is, what are your views on that? I, I think it's entirely possible. It, it's hard to say for sure, just again, because of how hard it is to be fossilized and the vagaries of preserving something. I would expect if we had a technologically advanced civilization that, you know, at least pick up hints of chemical and radiological signals and things like that. But again, I don't like to rule anything out. I'd rather just say, I don't know. The, look at it, see what you can find that might prove or disprove it. And even still, the 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 bottom line is you can't ever rule it out. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can't ever rule it out <laughs> unless you unless thing. you get a yes answer. You can't, you know. And I guess that's the case for even the fossil record itself with with animal species is that you go into this knowing that you're not going to know 
even a fraction, you know, a significant fraction of the species that actually have existed on Earth and that just have no record at all, right? Yeah, and it's like going back to the, the Idaho dinosaur record where we have this burrowing guy that's about 90 plus percent of the skeletal things that we find when you know there would have been a whole complex ecosystem there, but for some reason you're not preserving other large chunks of it. Yeah, and that's that's another thing is that, yeah, you may be finding dinosaur bones, but you may not be finding um, leaves, plants, you know, that were there. Oh, yeah. But the conditions just were not right. And, you know, it's right for bones, but it wasn't right for uh, leaves and things, right? It's just a little picky window. Now, speaking of leaves and plant remains, how's the Green River formation on on that count? In other words, do you see stuff other than fish and those types of uh, animals do you also see leaves and things preserved there oh yeah like uh, i like to go out every year my son and i go out and dig up fish out near camera at one of the commercial quarries and we'll find leaves and stuff in there too leaves are pretty common insects there's parts of the green river formation near vernal utah i used to live and work there where just for fun on the weekend i'd go out and split shale in the green river formation and it's famous because of the well-preserved plants that you'd find in there. Lots and lots of variety of uh, tropical plants. So it's it's world famous in those beds for those plants too. And you can tell that, that they're tropical from just the, I guess, the, the form of the leaf? Yeah, from the morphology of the leaves. Now, what's next as far as paleontology and you? What are you looking to do to further your research, presumably in dinosaurs in Idaho? Oh, let's see. So my current project I'm working on now that's taken way longer than I'd like, we've got a new species of Cretaceous crocodile from Idaho that we get to name. We've got a name chosen and everything, and it's it's a little, I'll just give a hint, it's what some people call the little fox crocs because they actually had erect legs under their bodies and they're like little foxes or cats more than a typical croc. But we've got that coming up. I've got a student, uh, shout out to my student, Heather, who is helping me at the College of Eastern Idaho. I just started a job at the College of Eastern Idaho. They were very generous and built me a paleo lab. And we're working on an armored dinosaur, a notosaur. And Heather's my first independent study student to work on that. We're going to get that cleaned and described. And I've got projects in Utah. I could go on. I'm I'm always keeping myself busy or distracted. Now, here's an off-the-wall question. Hot-blooded versus cold-blooded. Now, when you look at these species, uh, it seems clear at this point that some of the dinosaurs were warm-blooded, mm-hmm. yet obviously their reptile relatives were not. How hard is it to figure that one out? In other words, when you look at a crocodile, do you just make the assumption it was cold-blooded, or do you look at it and say, mm, maybe, you know, because if it's if it looks like a cat, that seems to suggest it might be able to run a little bit better than a, uh, than a modern crocodile would, right? Yeah, yeah, that it maybe had a higher metabolic rate. And that that's a really good question. Like you look at most prehistoric crocs, they've got a similar build where it looks like they weren't runners. So maybe a little bit more cold-blooded. With these little fox crocs, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're a little bit more warm-blooded. There's, there's so much research going both ways back and forth on that, especially on dinosaurs. There was a recent paper that came out that... And I'm not really good with geochemistry, chemistry in general, but there, were, there was some chemical evidence suggesting that the giant sauropod dinosaurs were probably actually warm-blooded, which surprised me because I was always partial to the hypothesis, for lack of a better term, that sauropods got the effects of being warm-blooded just because they had a lot of mass to retain body heat, but they were technically cold-blooded, meaning they wouldn't have to eat as much food to generate that heat. But this recent paper suggests that sauropods were warm-blooded, which means you'd have to eat a lot more. But I'm just going off here. There's a lot of research still going on that. And I think there's probably a variation or a gradation present in dinosauria and some of those related organisms between what we'd call warm and cold-blooded. Well, it's fascinating because when I first started reading about dinosaurs as a kid in the 1980s, we had no idea that any of them were warm-blooded. No clue. And oh, yeah. there was, I, I think it was the, the guy that popularized it, I think it was Robert Bacher back in the day. Yep. And that these things, some of them like the, the T-Rex, stereo vision, which is mm-hmm. amazing to think about, especially with, with something with a brain that small, but the, <laughs> which we'll get to that in a minute. But the, um, just the idea that, that a revolution 
and paleontology happened right in, in a lot of our, our lifetime. And I remember it where dinosaurs got a lot more interesting and a lot more divergent from what we thought. Dinosaur renaissance, they call the it. The dinosaur renaissance and just the idea of feathers. Changed everything. Changed everything. <laughs> and it's unbelievably alluring because it, you know, makes the connection to the birds. Oh, absolutely. And it, it <laughs> I mean, even extinction, the word extinction in the case of a dinosaur, well, not exactly because birds are still alive and well. Do you actually see a dinosaur when you look at a modern bird? I do. The funny thing is, as we record here, I'm, I'm at my parents' house using their internet. And behind me in the backyard, my dad has pens full of ducks and geese and pheasants and swans because he raises them recreationally. And I see dinos when I look at them. When I was a little kid, I remember when he'd laugh when the geese would chase me. And I was definitely seeing dinosaurs even then. So I didn't really think of it that way. So. I don't know if I did, but I had certainly been chased by Canada geese, the <laughs> bane of my existence. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, dinosaurs, and it, it, it amazes me when I sit and I watch the birds and try to imagine the dinosaurs because the birds have a perpetual aerial war going on with each other. Oh, yeah. You see small birds attacking hawks and all of this stuff, and it's just this aerial war that's gone on since, well, the age of the dinosaurs. Wouldn't you love to see some theropods doing that, so... I would, and I I, uh, I remember loving Jurassic Park, but that's dated now as far as depictions of dinosaurs. <laughs> what are your thoughts on those types of movies? Do you think that sort of fantasy paleontology is good, or is it uh, just, yeah, it's not reflecting the reality? Well, I think anything that gets people interested in dinosaurs and supporting the science that way is good. A lot of my uh, colleagues, similar age to me, they went into paleontology because of Jurassic Park. I do do, in one of my um, classes again, I teach a dinosaur class, dinosaur specific class, and our last lecture, other than the final, is where we actually watch one of the Jurassic Parks and critique the good and bad science. So I think they're great that way for getting people interested and, and helping people understand how science works. The other thing too is there's just something about bringing a dinosaur to life, you know, on the big screen to where you can not just imagine what it looked like. You're not just looking at a drawing in a book, but you're seeing a, you know, a CGI reconstruction of what, what we think they look like, uh, which changes. <laughs> um, now with the subject, do you think, and we're going to get into Jurassic Park heavy here. Do you think that there might ever be a way to resurrect a dinosaur or reconstruct it genetically? Oh, I'm not hedging my bets. I would love it if there was. The closest I've seen, I did my PhD at uh, Montana State, and a lot of dinosaur nerds might know the name Jack Horner. Jack was working on his dino chicken project there where he was going in and uh, turning genes back on in chickens to try and make them more dinosaur-like, which, you know, nothing could go wrong at all with that if you think of a horror movie. Oh, that would be fun. But, um, <laughs> But he, he was doing good on that, if I remember right. They managed to get teeth in the beaks. I think they had claws on the hands. I think they had a longer tail. And they just have these in the embryos, and they wouldn't let the embryos hatch and be viable for ethical, obvious ethical reasons. But they had luck that way. Another paleontologist from Montana State, Mary Schweitzer, that's been finding organic proteins in dinosaur bones, like B-Rex, I believe it's called. I don't know if we'd ever find enough to get a dinosaur back, but I think... Who knows what's going to happen as they continue to do what's called molecular paleontology and looking at uh, long dormant genes. So you can get some information from that, I'm sure. Long dormant genes and advancing technology on genetics, being able to build something from the ground up, essentially. And if you really had a really good command of that, which is way beyond anything we can even think about right now. But if you had a really good command of it, you could might be able to reconstruct a dinosaur from the ground up, I would imagine, in the distant far future. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't be totally surprised if you got that much control of it. You could at least build something that, that looks like it and maybe acts like it. So Yeah, yeah. Now, this, this sort of brings in something related. There have been reports for years now, dinosaur soft tissues preserving inside, deep inside bones occasionally, mm -hmm. just collagen and things like that. What are your thoughts on that? Is that compelling? I mean, is that... Does that appear to be what this is? That That's compelling. And generally, I think they've done sound science. That goes back to Mary Schweitzer and some of her colleagues. I've seen, you know, a healthy debate back and forth, whether um, it should be taken at face value. And again, not being super good with uh, geocam and things like that. But from what I understand and what I've read, 
I'm fairly confident in what they've got. I think I'm not super surprised that you'll have little bits of protein preserved like that in uh, some of these fossils. Do you think it's worthwhile to keep an eye out for that for even earlier organisms, you know, say a brachiopod or something like that from the Mississippian, that you might have the conditions somehow for something from that age to preserve, at least soft tissue wise? Oh, absolutely. I'd like to see him go back to our friends at Trilobites again and see if they can find stuff that way. Oh, that'd be fascinating. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Although I would expect a trilobite, not correct me if I'm wrong, but I would expect that to be pretty arthropod still, right? In other words, yeah. you know, you're going to see the same sorts of things that you see with modern arthropods, right? Yeah. Who, who knows what you'd find, but it would definitely be very similar to an arthropod. So, so the elephant in the room and this is a really big elephant that nobody really saw and didn't think I would do it, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> the idea of moving beyond astrobiology, which we both have a common lay interest in, is these days there's been a lot of talk about the UAP phenomenon, the UFOs. And one of the fantasies I have is if they've been here for the entire time and if they ever make contact with us, should they exist? You know, I'm not saying that that's what this is, but I'm just speculating like crazy. <laughs> and their gift to us when they say hello and land on the White House lawn is a complete record of the history of life on Earth. Would be the coolest thing any 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 species could ever do for another species is to, to do that. This is what the data we have on your planet from the whole time. And what are your thoughts given recent developments within it. What are your thoughts on the UAP as a scientist that's in a field that's not, you know, that's pretty far from this? Well, first off, I love your idea of getting that uh, that record of life on Earth. If, if any uh, non-human intelligence are listening and you want to come visit me and show me a, a video, you're welcome to. You get my permission. But as far as UAPs, I've always had an interest in that. As a kid, I had a little bit of an interest in that. I found it uh, interesting the past, all oh, since 2017, when uh, Leslie Keen and the New York Times article first came out, I found it more interesting that there seemed to be suggestions that there's, there's something there. Um, I think one thing a responsible uh, scientist can do is, what I've seen is people talking about UAP, sometimes it's almost just a, a debunking ad hominem attack, where you're attacking the person and not the idea. I do think that there's little hints and whispers of things at least suggesting that there's stuff to be investigated scientifically. I think your recent guest, and again, I'm going to butcher butcher her name, but help me remember Beatrice's last name again? Villarola. Villarola. Okay, yeah. But I think what she's doing, looking at uh, transients in orbit of the planet uh, prior to the use of satellites and things like that, I think that's interesting. I think that's science. And I think people should at least be open to looking at stuff like that through a scientific methodology. I think it's important, especially with the work of people like Gary Nolan, that seems to be showing pretty unambiguously that people get injured by whatever this is. Without speculating as to an origin, it's still concerning, you know, uh, and beholden to at least medical science to take a look at it, given that there's injuries reported on it. Now, your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. And I've, I've had, I teach a class at Idaho State and College of Eastern Idaho called Real Monsters which in general is the unofficial goal is to try and convert students into paleontology, geology, and biology. But one of our last lectures is where we talk about science being open to new ideas. And for this, I thought UAPs were valid enough that uh, we had uh, Dr. Nolan, where my class did a Zoom interview with him and asked him about UAPs as a scientific subject. We had uh, Lou Elizondo, we had Admiral Tim Gallaudet, and as I mentioned before, we're probably gonna bug Beatrice about doing this too. But I do definitely think that uh, science should be open to this again without uh, any preconceived ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, the case is increasingly being made that it should be that it's worth a look, especially when you have a U.S. Navy report that says, look, there's a certain percentage of things that we can't explain. We don't know what they are, definitely. which seems to me to be a mystery that scientists are like, well, let's see if I can figure out what that is. And that's the spirit of it. Right? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Now, my last question for you today is even broader than that, and it's another astrobiology question. And you, as someone in that in the science intimately related to this, mm -hmm. 
Do you think that life is common in the universe? And do you think that evolution to intelligence is common? Or is it rare in your view? Gut feeling. Gut feeling. Okay, so totally gut feeling life. I would expect and think that life is probably very common. And one thing I point out to my students again is, first off, though, how normal is the life on our planet? We have one example to look at out of who knows how big a sample size. But that being said, I expect that there's a glorious diversity of life. I would love to know for sure um, about that. As far as intelligent life, it's, it's really interesting. You know, looking at the history of the Earth, as far as we can tell, we didn't have human level intelligence until about four and a half billion years after the planet formed, even though life in some form had been around for greater than four billion. Gut feeling, moderately common, but totally non-scientific saying that, but I would not be surprised for other intelligences in the least. What about the dinosaurs? In other words, you remember the idea of the Trudon, as I recall, the idea of dinosaurs eventually having reached intelligence. Do you think that that might have happened? What are the makings there? Or were they simply on their way out anyway, even without the asteroid? Oh, there's so much debate still whether or not they're on their way out at the uh, end of the Cretaceous. But I'll go out on a limb and say I wouldn't be surprised if they stuck around long enough. If you could have had an intelligent, troodontid, scary-looking thing. So... Scary looking thing, but we were just talking about a crocodile that stands like a cat, which you now that's <laughs> scary, <laughs> especially if it had the stamina and was as fast as a cat. No, that would be terrifying. <laughs> it would be, you know, it's sitting there climbing a tree and jumping on you. From <laughs> I'm glad I live in the geologic age that I do. <laughs> At least well, maybe you've seen that reconstruction that a paleontologist did, Dale Russell, of the super intelligent troodontid that looked like one of those great aliens that gave me nightmares as a kid or he postulated yeah i remember it i remember it oh yeah too much i remember it too much because it gave me nightmares as a kid yeah, as well same here man <laughs> <laughs> well lj it's, a, it's been a blast and i hope you'll come back for all things paleontology in the future and i look forward to your next paper and your discoveries and <laughs> it's paleontology there's plenty of species left to announce Oh, I love this, man. Thank you guys for letting me share a little bit. I appreciate it. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.